Macleans were celebrated in Scotland for their great fighting skills, and as swords for hire, they were even sought after by Elizabeth I of England, who valued their military prowess and their refusal to surrender. But in the race to stay ahead of the game in Scotland's ever-changing political landscape, the Macleans weren't on quite such good form. And when the country was plunged into civil war, they backed the wrong horse, and even bravery on the battlefield couldn't save the clan from disaster. In this series, I'm going on a personal journey, uncovering the stories behind the clan names that have shaped our nation. Names that many of us share or know day to day. Because in Scotland, understanding clan roots gives a unique insight into our collective history. And one name which sums up the spirit of the warrior Highlander is Maclean. The most famous Maclean of recent history must be Sir Fitzroy Maclean, legendary World War II hero who specialised in commando raids behind enemy lines. Sir Fitzroy is most celebrated for his dangerous mission to Yugoslavia during World War II when he was sent by Churchill to help the resistance against the Nazis. It's generally believed that Sir Fitzroy's daring personality, the debonair gent on a dangerous foreign mission, was the inspiration for James Bond. The secluded Bosnian valley towards which I was descending looked dim and mysterious in the moonlight. I've come to a suitably Bond-like environment, Scotland's secret military bunker, to meet Sir Fitzroy's friend and colleague, Dr. Lorne McIntyre, to find out how Sir Fitzroy carried on the Maclean warrior tradition. Now, Lorne, we're in an old war room, and I imagine this was the kind of environment that Sir Fitzroy would have been quite familiar with. Oh, I'm quite certain that Fitzroy would be in these subterranean control rooms in London during the wartime. He probably met Churchill in such a place when they were planning a Fitzroy's entry by parachute into Yugoslavia in 1943 to help Tito and the Partisans. It's been said that Sir Fitzroy was the model for James Bond. Now, is that true? Well, some people feel that the story is apocryphal, but I quite believe it. If you look back on this man's career, it's extraordinary in terms of his bravery and his daring. He was not an officer remote from his men. This man would completely participate in everything that was thrown at him. He was a very large, very charismatic man. He was also tremendously conscious of his Maclean and Highland background. And I always imagined that to some extent through his reading of those people's lives, one has the feeling that he tried perhaps in his wartime service to emulate them. And he emulated them in terms of courage, and maybe sometimes he emulated them in terms of recklessness. So he was the last of the great Maclean warriors. It's very certain that you'll never see again a person that embodies the qualities of Fitzroy and Maclean. Sir Fitzroy personified the spirit of the Maclean clan, warriors who were not frightened to take risks. And it's a tradition that goes back some 800 years. Traditional Maclean lands occupied the Inner Hebrides, and the family seat was Dewart Castle, an imposing stronghold with a commanding view across the Sound of Mull. The story of how the Macleans secured this island as a family seat sums up the character of this impulsive clan who lived by the sword. Legend has it that Lachlan Lubenach Maclean, the fifth clan chief, went as far as kidnapping and marrying the daughter of the Lord of the Isles, the most powerful man in the Hebrides. The great Macdonald chief was forced to acknowledge and recognize this marriage with a dowry, which he did by giving the Macleans the island of Mull. Thanks to their fearless reputation, the Macleans built up a name as elite warriors, sought after to work as mercenaries both at home and abroad. For the Macleans, being swords for hire was an effective way of making a living, and the mercenary tradition was a significant part of 16th century Hebridean life. 
Every summer we can imagine these great fleets of birlings, of galleys, carrying the, the cream of Highland soldiery over from the Highlands to fight. Sword fighting expert David Thompson has studied the weapons and techniques of the Maclean's. Now, Dave, the Maclean's were famed throughout the Highlands for being swords for hire, for being mm -hmm. mercenaries. And mm -hmm. Are these the kind of swords that they would have used at the time? Yes, these are good examples of a uh, period of, of 1570s, 1580s. Uh, what we've got here is the long sword, hand and a half sword, right, with basket protection around it. The actual sword blade is a lot thinner than the previous long sword, more specific to uh -huh. get through armour of that period of time. And I'm afraid mercenaries would have been quite familiar with this type yes, of sword. Yes, it would be. The generations would be using a sword similar to this. What do you think it was about clan society that gave rise to this, this mercenary tradition? Through history and through time, the clans were fighting. The generations were fighting each other over power, over land, uh, over favour. Because of this, they were recruited by foreign lands because they've demonstrated and shown their effectiveness as mercenaries. So McLean mercenaries could have ended up in all kinds of different theatres of war? Yes, they could be recruited by the Dutch, the Poles, the Swedes, the Spanish through the Spanish wars. So they would have been loyal to whoever was paying them their shilling? Whoever would pay the, the most for the services. Now this looks very elaborate and ornate. This sword here is a side sword. This was more a personal weapon. This presumably would have been a status symbol as well. Because it? they're uh, gaining a lot of spoils of war, you can put money into weapons. Now we've seen the swords, Dave. Now I'd love to see some of these uh, killer and winning fighting techniques and I think you're going to give us a demonstration. I've got uh, two experts who are trained in this period of time sword fencing styles. Ah, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Slice my leg! <laughs> One of the most notorious Maclean chiefs who tried to capitalise on their military prowess was Lachlan Moore. While there are no images of him, we know that he was a formidable character who was determined to move his clan into the Premier League. Sir Lachlan Moore was chief at a very crucial juncture in Maclean history. They were almost at the very cusp of breaking into the big time. And the Maclean's chance to hit the big time came in the 1580s. Much has been made in Scottish history about the many battles fought against the English. What isn't mentioned quite so often is the fact that some clans actually worked with the English when it suited them. Now, when Elizabeth I of England was recruiting mercenaries for her war in Ireland, the Maclean's great reputation for fighting made them natural candidates for the job. England was involved in a bitter rebellion in Ulster, and Elizabeth I desperately needed mercenaries to fight on her side. With the promise of significant financial rewards, Lachlan Moore offered to provide Maclean men for the English campaign. The Maclean's made rather a good living out of being mercenaries over in Ireland. The Maclean's would fight shoulder to shoulder with the English, but they'd also fight shoulder to shoulder with England's arch enemy, the Spanish, if it suited their purpose. And in one of the most unusual episodes in clan history, the Maclean's did exactly that. In 1588, the Spanish Armada set sail with the intention of invading England and deposing Elizabeth I. But it didn't go according to plan. The invasion failed and things got even worse for the Spaniards. Freak storms swept the fleeing Armada off course and, in a bizarre twist of fate, one of the ships ended up here in the Hebrides. The San Juan de Sicilia had become separated from the rest of the Spanish fleet. Believing she was lost, the returning armada sailed on without her. But the San Juan, with crack troops from Spain's finest regiments on board, was struggling on, her sails in rags and her hull badly damaged by the lashing storms. On the 23rd of September, 1588, she was spotted in the Hebrides. Mull Museum archivist Jean Whitaker has written about the arrival of these unexpected visitors. What probably happened was that the Maclean's invited her up here 
um, one can imagine perhaps them going out and saying, well, we know just the spot for you boys. Lovely harbour, plenty of fresh water. They were always very short of fresh water. Uh, and we'll see you right. How do you think the locals back then would have reacted to the sight of this, of this Spanish galleon sailing into Tobomori Bay? Well, they must have been amazed by the sight of it. Um, they probably hadn't seen anything like it. Um, and she was huge. Her masts were over 100 feet, and you would have seen her masts towering above the island. There were about 300 soldiers and they got them up to Tobamori, and once they were here, they said, well, you're here, there's just a wee job you could do for us. And the little job the Macleans had in mind was to use the Spanish troops to join them in a raid on their neighbors, the McDonald's. Lachlan Moore took off a hundred of the Spanish fighting men and went on the rampage in Ardnamurchen and the Small Isles on a raid against the McDonald's. In return for the Macleans repairing their ship, the Spaniards agreed to join them in an attack on MacDonald lands in rum, egg, canna and muck. With the help of the Spanish mercenaries, the Macleans decimated the MacDonalds. It was a dramatic victory for Chief Lachlan Moore that was mythologized in clan folklore. It was a straightforward, if rather unfortunate, meteorological fate that brought the Spanish to Tobamori. But the Macleans had a far more exotic explanation for why they landed in Scotland. According to Maclean legend, the King of Spain's daughter had fallen in love with a Maclean chief in a dream, and she'd searched the world to find him. The joke is that the King of Spain's daughter thought that Lachlan Moore Maclean was a suitable match for her. And uh, it, it gives us a, a, an idea of how the Macleans saw themselves. The Macleans version of what brought the ship to Tobamori does indeed sound a little far-fetched. But what happened next is a matter of historical fact. In November 1588, the Spanish ship, repaired and restocked with fresh supplies, was ready to set sail. But it would never return to Spain. One night, it was mysteriously blown up and sank. The San Juan had ended its journey here in Tobamori Bay. It's suspected that Elizabeth I, who feared the Spanish were trying to use Scotland as a base from which to attack England, sent a spy to blow up the vessel. But we'll probably never know the truth about what sank the San Juan de Sicilia. For the past 400 years, many people have searched Tobermory Bay for the wreck, but few have been motivated by principles of pure historical interest, and that's because, according to legend, Spanish gold was on board. There have been countless dives to try and find the gold over the past 100 years. But while some debris from the wreck has been recovered, nothing of any real value has ever been found. But th this is typical. Uh, Spanish oak. Most historians are now convinced the stories of gold are a myth, but the legend remains a powerful attraction to treasure hunters. The involvement of Spanish soldiers in a local clan feud is certainly one of the more unusual episodes in Highland history. The Macleans could never have anticipated such an exotic source of military support to help them beat their rivals, the McDonald's. But Lachlan Moore's victory was to be short-lived. He was killed during yet another dispute over land with the McDonald's, this time on Isla in 1598. One of the oldest known Gaelic songs is about this battle, the Battle of Tri Grunat. <laughs> Ishmael, that's a beautiful song. What's it actually saying? It's talking about the fact that it was in the shores of Loch Grunyart that the hero has, has been left behind, and that hero is deemed to be Lachlan Moore Maclean. Um, and it's talking about his, his prowess in battle, his, the, how fantastic a man he was, and what a great leader he was. 
It's one of the oldest uh, known songs still in existence. So the, al although there would have been older songs, they don't exist anymore. We don't know them. So it's one of the oldest songs that we still know. <laughs> Now this is a, an absolutely beautiful, fantastic spot and it's hard to imagine that something so dark as a battle ever took place here. What actually happened? It, it, was, it was really horrific. When the Maclean's came, they landed in, on the shores of, of Grunyart uh, and the battle was fought around here. They were fighting the McDonald's and the Maclean's hugely outnumbered the McDonald's and, the, and you know the odds really were on their side. However, the McDonald's beat them and the McLeans were trying to make for their ships to take them back to Mull. They took refuge in the church and the McDonald's set fire to the church and uh, burnt them inside that church. This burnt to death? Yes. Horrific. It's absolutely. such a beautiful place. It is absolutely horrific, yeah. The death of Lachlan Moor was a major blow for the Macleans, but there was worse to come. The Macleans had built their success on their military prowess, but James VI, newly crowned King of England and Scotland, was determined to bring an end to the mercenary tradition. The Statutes of Iona, which James passed in 1609, banned the bearing of arms. He wanted to turn fighting men into farmers. That flow of money is cut off. That means that the Western clans, the clans of the Western seaboard, who had been making a lot of money as mercenaries over the past, say, 50, 60 years, perhaps even longer, well, they were now in a bit of a financial strait at that time. That hit the Maclean's very hard. Robert Dodgson believes the warriors, who'd once been the Maclean's source of income and pride, became a millstone around their necks. It must have created real problems for a, 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 a clans like that of the Maclean's, because overnight, large numbers of fighting men suddenly had to find other forms of, uh, of livelihood. So clan society within the Maclean clan becomes top-heavy, really? Yes, uh, that, that would be a, a good way of, of, of describing it. Uh, these fighting men, these mercenaries, were forced to work for a living, which was absolutely anathema, uh, because obviously there had always been a distinction and status between the fighting men and those who actually work the land. It was a challenge not to their way of life, but to their, their very status. But the Maclean's had lost more than just their status. They'd lost their livelihood, and the clan struggled to adjust to a new type of Scotland. A Scotland where the pen was mightier than the sword, and contracts more important than kinship. In the 17th century, Edinburgh was becoming the focus for commercial activity in the country. Scotland was changing, and a bit like today with the global credit crunch, debt, cash and the lack of it were becoming a huge problem, and many chiefs faced bankruptcy. But, as is always the case, one man's misfortune could be another man's opportunity. The Maclean's tried to keep themselves afloat by obtaining loans, using their land as security. But it was a fatal mistake. They borrowed heavily from Clan Campbell, the most powerful family in Scotland and notoriously hard-nosed. Through time, they can't pay the money back. So whoever holds the debt can then seize the land. And nine times out of ten, the person who holds the debt is the chief of Clan Campbell. The Maclean's had chosen the worst possible people to become indebted to. The Maclean's are hauled before a Campbell court. So the Campbells are able to impose punitive fines on the Maclean's, and in turn the Maclean's have to mortgage their lands and then give over parts of the lands to the Campbells. They stop at nothing in terms of extending their own power and making sure that the Maclean's don't get the better of them. 
By the 1640s, the Macleans had lost huge swathes of their land to the Campbells. So when civil war broke out, it came as little surprise that the Macleans took the opposite side to the Campbells. They are so indebted to Campbell, to the Campbells, that they see the best way of getting out of their difficulties is to support the king. So they throw themselves into the, the melee, if you like, on the royalist side. The Macleans were gambling on the royalist cause coming good. If they won, then their arch enemies, the Campbells, would be destroyed and the Macleans could reclaim their lands. But if the anti-royalist covenanting side won, which the Campbells were supporting, the Macleans would be finished forever. It was a huge gamble. And the Campbells, furious that the Macleans were backing the Royalists, announced their determination to ruin them. But historian Alan McInnes believes the Macleans had little choice. They were never going to beat the Campbells in the courtroom. The battlefield was their only chance. Is this really a feud between the Macleans and the Campbells being played out against the, the backdrop of the Civil War, Alan? Essentially, it is a feud, although there are important political and religious considerations lining the Campbells up with the Covenanters and the Macleans up with the Royalists. But feuding is at the core of this issue. To what extent were the Macleans gambling by supporting the Royalists? The Macleans are gambling hugely, but they have little choice. They are in a situation where the Campbells are taking over their estates piece by piece. If they don't take action against them, they will lose their estates. So for them, they have to fight. They can't be neutral. If they're neutral, they will lose. And betting each way was not even an option for them? There was no possibility if an each way bet for them. It had to be on the nose. It was all or nothing. And in this case, it's largely nothing. The Civil War was to end in bloody defeat for the Royalists and result in utter disaster for the Macleans. The battle which decimated the clan and ended their hopes of reclaiming their lands was fought in Fife in 1651. The Scottish Royalist forces, including some 800 Macleans, met Cromwell's army at the Battle of Inverkeething. The scene of the battle is now a quiet housing development with little evidence of its grisly history. Historian Alex Sutherland believes the Macleans' defeat here destroyed the clan. So what have we got here, Alex? A cairn to the memory of Sir Hector Maclean after the Battle of Inverkeething, and this is the site of the Maclean's greatest defeat. It was, and it really it was the beginning of the end of the Maclean's as a clan took a tremendous mauling here. These were bloody times, you have to remember. There was very little quarter given, and the Maclean's didn't surrender. That was one of the th problems with them. They really sh perhaps should have done, and they may have survived, but because they didn't, it earned them the epithet of the Spartans of the North, which in a way was a backhanded compliment, because it, it was really a... a situation of madness. The Battle of Inverkeething has gone down in clan history as one of the most courageous displays by the Macleans ever. It's said that the clansmen fought desperately to save their chief, but their efforts were in vain. Along with nearly 800 of his men, Hector Maclean perished on the fields of Fife, together with the hopes of his clan. Greatly weakened by these huge losses, the Macleans were little match for the mighty Campbells, who continued to take their lands in lieu of their debts. And in 1691, the Macleans lost the symbolically important Jewett Castle, the clan's historic power base. The story of the Macleans from warriors of the Western Isles to virtual bankruptcy can be summed up by the Gallic word dolcious, meaning downfall. How a clan's once mighty ambitions turn ultimately to dust. The Macleans demonstrate that if you get on, make the wrong decision and keep making the wrong decision, there is no way back. For the next 200 years, the Macleans would be a clan without a home. Jewett would pass through a series of hands and by the beginning of the 20th century, the castle was rapidly heading towards ruin. But fortune would at last shine on the Macleans. In the early 1900s, the clan managed to buy Jewett back. And Sir Lachlan Maclean is the third chief to once more live at the family seat on Mull. And this gentleman here is the man responsible for restoring the castle. Yeah, that's, that's the Fitzroy, um, who 
bought the castle back in 1910 when he was well into his 60s, restored it just before the First World War and then went on to live to be 101. And Locke played quite a large part in Sir Fitzroy's story because he was, I understand, in the Crimean War. Yes. Well, he was a young um, cavalry officer and um, he would have charged in the Light Brigade, but in fact was, had dysentery and was put in charge of the reserve horses. So it's pretty unlikely, I suspect, that if he had charged, I'd have been standing here now because he'd almost definitely been killed, I suspect. So that was a lucky tummy bug, really? That was a lucky, <laughs> a lucky tummy bug, yeah. So there were some great obstacles for him to overcome, presumably. Well, yes, I, mean, I think the first obstacle was that the people who owned it um, saw him coming and thought, well, there's only one person who's going to want to buy Dirt back, and they had to negotiate a price which was still pretty significant. And what condition was the castle in when he took over? Well, it, there was no roof and no floors and everything, also the internal bit had collapsed, including the sort of vaults and the, in, the, in the ground floors. The walls were all crumbly. Cattle were moving in and out of it. And I mean, I think, you know, it, it was a massive task, actually. And he was determined to do it. It must have been a tremendously exciting moment when Sir Fitzroy was able to bring the clan back to Jewett for the first time in, what, 200 years? Yes. And this picture here, is that of the, the early clan gathering? Yes, that's the first gathering that took place in um, 1912. And uh, these are all uh, the people who, who came sitting on a bank that is still there. No. These are the Macleans. This is the Clan Maclean at Jewett for the first time in yes, centuries. Yes, absolutely. Now, amongst these Macleans is another famous Sir Fitzroy, but much younger. Well, yes, um, Sir, Sir Fitzroy, who worked with Tito in, in Yugoslavia. I mean, he was here in a pram somewhere. Um, a baby Sir Fitzroy. A, a, a baby, baby Sir Fitzroy. This is a, an absolutely superb location. I mean, what does it make you feel knowing that your own personal story is connected to generations of Macleans who've stood in this spot looking out across at that fantastic view? Macleans come here from all over the world. They come here to start their search for whatever they're looking for. And they, a lot of them have no idea where they came from. But you can actually say to them, well, those mountains that you're looking at there or those mountains you're looking at there, they haven't changed in thousands of years, so your family probably looked at them just like we're looking at them today. So you may not find the croft where you were born or exactly where you came from, but, but this is your country. I mean, this is, this is home for you. After nearly two and a half centuries, the Macleans had finally come home. The clan that had lived by the sword but had failed to adapt to changing times, had produced a line of great warriors. So it's fitting, perhaps, that this fighting tradition should have culminated in the 20th century with Sir Fitzroy Maclean, the most versatile and modern of all Maclean warriors.